Good morning, everyone. If we could all take our seats. OK. Uh, there's a few seats up front here. Don't be shy. Um, there's a few seats at the front table. So for those of you standing in the back, there's, there's still plenty of room. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here at CSIS. Uh, first, I want to welcome you all to CSIS and to the CSIS Military Strategy Forum, uh, which over the course of time has brought senior defense leaders to present their vision and insights on the direction of U.S. defense policy and military strategy. Uh, CS is really most grateful to Rolls-Royce uh, North America for their support for this uh, series, which has been really fascinating. Uh, I'm particularly pleased today to welcome uh, General Carter Hamm, uh, commander of the U.S. Africa Command. Uh, General Hamm, I think you can say, is still fairly new to the command, having been in his position less than six months. Um, although I think with everything that's happened in those six months, uh, you must feel quite a bit longer. Um, the general came to the command uh, March 9, 2011. Uh, Ten days later, Operation Odyssey Dawn was launched in Libya. Uh, the front end of an AFRICOM-led coalition to enforce the UN Security Council resolution uh, on Libya. Uh, the Libyan crisis, I think that initial front edge went, went very well, I think by all assessments, but the crisis obviously is not yet over. There are huge uncertainties now, um, how that country will rebuild itself, uh, how it will hold itself together, what has always been a very deeply fragmented societies. Uh, a, a lot of uncertainty about the regional fallout uh, of a vacuum in Libya uh, into the Sahel and beyond, and perhaps to some extent political fallout from within Africa surrounding kind of the role of AFRICOM and, and, and the NATO uh, intervention. In that time, Sudan went from one state to two, with South Sudan formally declaring independence on July 9. Uh, huge uncertainties there uh, politically and economically, and most immediately in terms of security, ongoing violence, uh, huge fragility, uh, problems with the integration of militaries, building a pro professional military force, uh, demobilization, and so forth. Uh, in that time, we saw a major upsurge in uh, attacks by Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria, uh, including the attack against UN headquarters in, in Abuja in August. Uh, we've seen the unfolding of an epic and tragic humanitarian crisis in the Horn, uh, particularly the famine in Somalia that threatens uh, close to a million people with famine, uh, with Al-Shabaab uh, just, uh, just today having launched, again, major attacks within Mogadishu. Uh, so that back and forth in Somalia continues. Piracy in Somalia, but now we're hearing increasing supports from West Africa. Um, and then the ongoing issues that, that have been there for a long time, the DRC um, capacity building more broadly, and so forth. And also, I think there's debates here in Washington, D.C., um, and probably struggles that you have to fight here in terms of uh, budget cuts um, and what that may mean for the command going forward. Uh, anyway, we have no doubt that you are up to all these challenges. General Ham brings uh, 36 years of service. Uh, his, 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 which has included assignments in uh, uh, Georgia, Italy, Germany, to name a few, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Macedonia, and Iraq. He's had a tremendous breadth of experience in, in a series of very tough jobs uh, in Macedonia, uh, in, uh, in Mosul during the, the, the very dark days of the Iraq War. Uh, he was previous, uh, previous assignment as commanding general of the U.S. Army uh, Europe. Uh, most recently, leading the investigation into the Fort Hood shootings uh, and the delicate issue of uh, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, some very difficult and sensitive jobs. And I think people have, have remarked to me um, that you, you're quiet and you listen um, and very deliberate and, and, and very fair-minded in, um, in all of these circumstances, and we appreciate that. Um, we are so delighted to have you here. We're going to keep it fairly informal. General Ham will talk for 10 minutes, uh, then we'll, I'll ask maybe a few questions and we'll open up for discussion with the audience. So thank you, and General Ham, thank you. Thanks for, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, it, it is uh, great to be here, and thanks uh, very much for inviting me to have the chance to talk a bit about, uh, about Africa and, and Africa Command. Um, as Jennifer kind of laid out what I've, what I've been doing as a soldier over the past several years, you'll notice no, none of that addressed any service in Africa uh, or any association with Africa. 
Um, and, and I think that's kind of where we have been as a military and certainly growing up in the Army. Uh, Africa was not on our horizon. It wasn't an area that, that a continent that we thought much about. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, certainly in the forefront of, of any of our activities. <clears throat> uh, but that has dramatically changed, uh, certainly over the past several years. Uh, recognized uh, in 2007, 2008, uh, when President Bush uh, decided to, to form U.S. Africa Command, kind of birthing it out of U.S. US European Command, as many as you will recall, for, which formerly had responsibility for U.S. military engagement in, in Africa. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I, I have been there about six months, and, and uh, it's not quite been the six months I expected. It started <laughs> a little differently than I had anticipated. Um, uh, but you, it's a reminder that you don't get to control things uh, all the time, and, and uh, the world situation uh, evolves in ways and, and in directions that sometimes are, are not anticipated. Um, six months into this job, I would say that I'm at the point now where I'm just beginning to understand what I don't know about Africa. Uh, the complexity, diversity, uh, the severity of the security challenges that that spread across the continent um, can be a little staggering. And, and, uh, and it's easy sometimes to feel a little bit overwhelmed. And I would tell you uh, that what, what keeps me from uh, feeling overwhelmed is uh, in my travels and encounters with African leaders, both military and civilian. And in almost every case, what I find as I interact with them is a very clear-eyed view of the security challenges that they face. They, they, they're not Pollyannish about this. They know that there are some very serious problems that they have to address, and in most cases have a pretty good idea about how to do that. Um, and they realize that they, in almost every case, these are some long-term efforts uh, required. These aren't, these aren't problems that, uh, that lend themselves to quick and easy solutions. If they did, they would have been solved already. And these are, these are tough, in many cases, long-standing issues. Uh, as, so the challenge for us at U.S. Africa Command is to find ways in which we can help Africans uh, uh, address these concerns. We're guided uh, at the command by two overarching principles. One, the first uh, is, is one that was espoused by President Obama in his trip to, to Ghana in uh, 2009, where he made the, the clear statement that, somewhat obvious, but we, we seek African solutions to African problems. And, uh, and, and I think for us at U.S. Africa Command, the, the, the corollary to that is that, is that uh, in the long run, Africans are better able uh, to, uh, to address African security uh, challenges. Um, but as uh, some military leaders in, in Africa have, have told me, they need a little bit of help in some cases. And uh, so we look to, to partner uh, with Africans where we can, where, we're, where our uh, help and assistance is, is welcome uh, to, to uh, help them address their security problems. The, the second under, underlying principle uh, in all that we do is just, again, a, a, a statement of the obvious, but that a, a safe, stable, secure Africa is in the best interest not only of the Africans, but of the United States of America. Uh, it is in our best interest that, that uh, stability pervade. Uh, and so we, fi again, find ways, uh, look for ways in which we can, uh, can, can contribute to that. Uh, last month, a few weeks ago, at the UN General Assembly, President Obama uh, talked about uh, this, uh, this year being a, a year of extraordinary transformation. And I think he could make a pretty good argument. I think I could make a pretty good argument that Nowhere has that extraordinary transformation been more evident than in the continent of Africa. Uh, from north to south, east to west, uh, region to region, uh, there are significant changes afoot uh, that uh, portend uh, significant uh, uh, security implications for, for us and certainly for the Africans. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of where, where we are, uh, what we're trying to do, I, I'll hit a couple of regions uh, briefly and then, and then uh, uh, look forward to your questions and, and, and the discussion with you. 
for, for me, uh, East Africa becomes the highest priority region uh, for a host of reasons, but uh, unfortunately, it, it is in East Africa where, where m most of the negative uh, security issues are, are present. There certainly are violent extremist organizations. Uh, there's the, the very close uh, seam between uh, Africa and uh, the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda, East Africa, Al-Shabaab, uh, a growing relationship there which is, which is certainly of concern. Uh, there's piracy, there's a new nation of South Sudan, the security force assistance that has required their uh, horrific uh, famine and loss of life in the Horn of Africa, specifically in, in Somalia at present. Uh, we have legislated action here in the United States that requires us to, uh, to assist in countering the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, I mean, there's a, and there's, so the number of issues that are kind of concentrated in East Africa, uh, to me, uh, make that the, the area that requires uh, our greatest attention at, at present. It's also an area where we have some very willing partners. Uh, and I would note specifically Uganda and Burundi and their contribution to the African Union mission in Somalia, which is, which is having a very positive effect and in, in, uh, in, in doing quite well there. Uh, they're looking for ways where they can follow their own doctrine and ours as well, which is exploit success. Uh, so we'll, we'll look for ways that we might partner with them. Next for me is the Sahel and Al-Qaeda in the lands of the Islamic Maghreb, a relatively small but unfortunately uh, uh, still uh, strong and, 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 in, and in many ways still a growing organization that creates a, de a high degree of instability in the Sahel region uh, and an espoused uh, uh, intent to attack uh, Westerners and, and to include U.S. interests. Uh, so I think AQIM uh, remains a very a significant issue with us and particularly uh, concerning at present is the proliferation of weapons that uh, that may be coming out out of Libya and I suspect that's something we may want to talk about in the in the discussion phase moving a little bit south of that as Jennifer mentioned Boko Haram in, in Nigeria uh, is is also transforming I think from from perhaps a, uh, an organization that was that looked primarily internally uh, it, it, but is now increasing their violence and certainly has increased uh, the rhetoric and their intent to uh, target Western uh, and including U.S. Uh, um, uh, interests in, in the region. Their 26 August attack uh, against the U.N. headquarters in Abuja I think is, is evident of that. And so for those that had any question about uh, Boko Haram's uh, violent nature and their motive, I think that was largely put to rest uh, in that attack in August. So, so as they talk about the extremist organizations, Al-Qaeda East Africa, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda the lands of the lands of the Islamic Maghreb, and Boko Haram, each individually of concern, but what really concerns me is at least a stated intent uh, for those organizations to link and synchronize their efforts and that to me would be a very very dangerous uh, uh, outcome for us. Um, more broadly we do focus uh, with our African partners on maritime security had uh, uh, some very good successes in the in the in the Gulf of Guinea in the West where the economic community of West African states ECOWAS, the economic, economic community of Central African states ECOS, uh, have collaborated uh, at the regional level and, and, the and the individual states to increase their uh, maritime do domain awareness intelligence sharing, uh, to collaborate more closely on maritime security, working out legal agreements that would allow things such as hot pursuit of, of criminals or pirates uh, in, in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, increasing the capacity of, uh, uh, of coast guards and, and navies in the in the country to counter illicit trafficking and piracy. So, uh, so a lot of success uh, there as, as well. Um, our efforts at Africa Command are, are less present, less visible the, the further south we go, but we have uh, some strong partnerships there as well. Uh, uh, south Africa has recently uh, uh, expressed great interest in, in addressing piracy uh, and the, in, in the uh, 
on, on their coast. And I think this is a great area in which South Africa could uh, could and should take a leading role, and I think they'll be quite effective uh, in that area as well. And if there are some ways we can help, we'll look forward uh, to to that. At the end of all that, you kind of say, okay, well, well, you know, what is it that you want to achieve? Well, we one of the things I've tried to do in a, as I talk with the command is we should never lose sight of who we are. We are first and foremost a Department of Defense uh, geographic combatant command. And our primary responsibility is to protect America, Americans, and American interests uh, from threats that uh, transit or might emanate uh, from, from the continent of Africa. Uh, we think we do that most effectively uh, by strengthening the defense capabilities of, of African states uh, and regional organizations. Again, back to the principle of Africans are better able to address African security challenges. But, at, but, but that's what we do. If you ask me what keeps me awake at night, it is the, is the thought of an of a, of a, a, a American passport holding uh, person who transits to a, a training camp in Somalia and gets some skill and then finds their way back into the United States uh, to attack uh, Americans here at our homeland. That's mission failure for us. Uh, and, and so that's what we've got to remain ever vigil vigilant for is that kind of threat that, uh, that addresses our, our country. It's been a fascinating first six months uh, for me. I've enjoyed the, uh, the, the multiple dimensions of, of the command and the, the, the complexity and, and diversity of the mission sets that we uh, that we're, uh, have on our plate. I should mention, as Jennifer talked about, you know, we are, the reality is we're in a different fiscal situation than uh, than, uh, than, than anticipated, and so we're not sure what, that, what that's going to mean for us just yet. I, I think the, the, way I, the way I would I choose to address this when, within the command is twofold. I think, first of all, it will require us to have a much sharper prioritization. Uh, I think we're going to have to there are, we're gonna be more clear about where are the highest priority efforts for us, uh, at the other end of that spectrum, that probably means there are some things that the U.S. military has done in the past that we're likely to not be able to continue, or we will do it smaller or less frequently than we have in the past. Uh, we've got to do that in collaboration with our partners at, at State and AID and, and a number of other agencies uh, as well. Secondly, I think uh, the, the fiscal realities will, will drive us uh, to a more regional approach rather than a, a series of bilateral engagements. Um, I think that actually fits pretty well with the direction that, uh, that the African Union and others would like to head in terms of building regional capacity. Uh, so I think our efforts actually might be complementary in, in that regard. So with that, I'll just pause and, and uh, see where, where you'd like to go in terms of question, uh, questions or discussion. Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, kind of, uh, again, it just reminds us how many <laughs> diverse challenges you face for, from all, uh, from so many angles. Um, maybe just to start, uh, in terms of, um, uh, I think many of the, the battles when, when AFRICOM was first established, in terms of reactions from African countries, um, some of that still happens. but. Um, I think General Ward spent much of his time kind of putting out those uh, kind of uh, those kind of fires. I think um, trying to explain what the command was, what it what it wasn't, um, and in that it kind of gave this sense of a uh, in some in some ways the command emphasized much more the the softer side of capacity of capacity building and longer term partnership and so forth, which are all important to the harder side, but but. I think that, in some ways, that almost got overemphasized, um, uh, and I think kind of the apologi unapologetic statement of "we're there for for U.S. interests" is important. But I wonder if Libya, if Somalia, if some of the 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 reports on drones, if some of the kind of difficult political relationships we have to establish because of um, uh, because we have we need security partners. Are, are you feeling blowback? Is there kind of been a resurgence from some of the African partners on, on some of those older debates on what Africa mean, AFRICOM means and what kind of presence um, 
is, is desired or wanted in Africa? Or are people saying, look, we need you? I mean, which is the... Yeah, good, thank you. I, I should say at the outset, just uh, uh, say we, we, would, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are without the efforts of, of General Ward. Um, he saw, uh, unlike anybody else, me included, he saw Libya coming. Um, and I don't, I don't think he knew exactly how it would unfold, but he saw something coming and formed the, the Joint Task Force well ahead of time, uh, any, anybody else saw something coming. So he had some great vision, and it was his, his uh, significant effort on building personal and professional relationships that, that has allowed the command to continue. Um, I, I was worried about that, frankly. I was, you know, as, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, you know, you know, ten days into the command, and we and we begin kinetic operations uh, in a place where we hadn't talked much about kinetic operations before. And so I I, I was uh, concerned about how that how that might unfold. Uh, in in an early trip into the continent, uh, talking with military leaders, I, I asked them just frankly that question. I, you know, is this, uh, is this uh, activity, are our military operations in Libya, uh, is that going to affect the, the relationship that Africa Command has and seeks to, uh, to continue with you or with your partners? And uh, one of a senior African leader, as I had the military leader, as I was having this discussion, kind of leaned back in his chair and uh, said, General, uh, the Africans who hate you will still hate you, and the Africans who don't hate you still won't hate you. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought that was a, a pretty mature <laughs> approach. That 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 you know one specific thing isn't going to to alter that oper uh, the uh, the opinion of of the command. Um, the military, more than civilian leaders. Uh, you know, were kind of the opinion says, you know, we, we always knew who you were. I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't put a military command if you didn't have, you know, some vision that at some point you might have to conduct military operations. Um, it, it has been a point of discussion, to be sure, as, uh, as I travel around Africa. There's no question, but in, uh, in, in some countries, and, and there is a very uh, differing view uh, about, uh, about Libya. There's not much disagreement about the, about the end state. Clear agreement on the necessity to protect surveillance. Pretty near agreement that uh, Mr. Gaddafi, Libya would be better off with, uh, without Mr. Gaddafi and better with a, a, a government that the people were able to select. Lots of disagreement about how to get there. Um, and uh, and, and that's, that's okay. So we've had, we've had that discussion. Um, I have, I've, there's been no instance uh, where, at least none that I'm aware of, that any country has backed away from uh, or reduced, uh, asked to reduce their, their military to military engagement exercises or anything like that with, uh, with us as a result of, of Libya. Uh, as I, as again, as I go around the country, almost every place is, it's, can you do more? We'd like to, you know, can we, can we host an exercise here? Can you do that? Can you do this? So, um, e even in places where there's disagreement about the way in which uh, the operations were conducted, uh, the relationships are still strong. Um, just, just one more question before I open it up. One of the State Department's big priorities uh, uh, coming in in the Obama administration was rebuilding some of the relationships with big, important powers, I'm thinking Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, um, that had been somewhat kind of neglected and, and become a little bit prickly in some ways. Um, perhaps Nigeria less so, but South Africa, Angola, I think there's a, a real keen desire by the State Department to try to broaden that engagement somewhat. Um, South Africa, obviously, we've had ups and downs. I mean, we consider them a good friend, but it, it does get prickly at times. Um, and it, it seems like the maritime security aspect may be kind of w one way to, to, to build out on a, on a more, um, on, on a broader um, security uh, relationship with them. Um, I'm wondering what are the reactions, obviously Boko Haram in Nigeria now, are you, I mean, Angola, 
Can you talk a little bit about those three countries and kind of the reception? The three countries that have capacities that few other African countries have uh, yeah. in terms of peacekeeping, in terms of conflict uh, resolution and so forth. Yeah, sure. I, they, are, they are three very important countries. <coughs> I'm, I haven't found an unimportant country yeah, in well, Africa well, yet. The little ones come uh, up in uh, Yeah, but, but in terms of capacity, uh, so starting with, with Nigeria, it's, it's very clear, you know, Ni Nigeria is the, the leading country for most activities uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea, uh, you know, a, 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 a very significant role in, in ECOWAS. Uh, they, they, they lead a number of, of other missions uh, uh, in, in a variety of places. Uh, we, we have had uh, a long-standing and very helpful, <coughs> a very useful uh, naval and air military uh, relationship. Um, less, uh, uh, less strong with the, with, the, with, the, uh, with the Army. And in my visit to uh, Bujo, I had a great meeting with the Chief of the Army Staff um, uh, following President Jonathan's visit here with President Obama. And I think we're, we're now uh, starting to, to, to find ways in which we can cooperate more closely. Very clearly, uh, Boko Haram has altered that relationship mm -hmm. uh, uh, somewhat. And so there's, we're looking for ways in which we can help, uh, ways that Nigeria would like us to be able to help in developing their, uh, their counterterrorist uh, capabilities, uh, things such as non-lethal training and non-lethal equipment uh, uh, to be more precise in the application of force, I think, are, are ways in, in, uh, in which, which we can proceed. Uh, the, similarly, as we, as, as we engage military to military, uh, state and AID and, and many others in the international community are working with Nigeria to help address the underlying causes. Uh, that, that it, from which Boko Haram g gathers some strength. So, you know, particularly, uh, you know, the dissatisfied youth and, and others uh, that, that, so there's programs underway there as well. And it is finding, helping Nigeria find the right balance. And, and for us in the military, how can, how can we help? What we, what we know very clearly is that a single track military effort won't, won't, won't satisfactorily address this. And the Nigerians very clearly understand that. So a, a strong and growing relationship uh, with Nigeria. And Angola, on the other hand, has been largely uh, hands-off for, 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 uh, for quite a while. Um, we, we are starting now uh, to have a, uh, the foundation of a good maritime uh, relationship with Angola. And I think, that, I think the maritime domain is prob will probably be the, the area of main emphasis for us is where they have asked uh, for some help. Uh, our Sixth Fleet commander has been there on a visit to, again, to start to establish that relationship. And I, and I think that's one that, uh, that, that bears promise. We look to partner with the, the Portuguese, who, you know, small but a longstanding relationship. And, and, and I should mention more broadly as we, you know, that many of the Europeans have, have longer and, and experience in Africa than we do in uh, and while not always positive, we, we, we seek to, to uh, partner with them as we move forward. And in South Africa, I absolutely agree with you. South Africa, a very large, very powerful nation in, in every domain, uh, uh, diplomatically, uh, economically, and certainly in the security sector as, as well. Um, South Africa and, and, the, and Africa Command uh, have, have not had the, the strongest ties. Uh, General Ward put a lot of, con a lot of per personal energy into that, and and I think uh, took some, uh, gained some significant ground in demystifying uh, Africa Command. Uh, last uh, this past summer, we had uh, the largest uh, exercise in the post-apartheid era. Uh, the military-to-military -military relationships are are are, uh, are strong and growing. Um, I, I, it, what, what we hope to do, again, is find ways in which South Africa would, would, uh, would like some assistance. Um, they, they should rightfully, in my opinion, uh, continue in a leadership role uh, in Africa and even, uh, even in a more broadly internationally of leading African Union uh, missions, leading UN missions, 
certainly their their uh, their role in the South Africa development community of of uh, uh, addressing piracy on a regional basis, I think, are, are all positive indicators. Um, let's open it up uh, for questions. Yes. Yes, the gentleman uh, here. Dave if, with and there's a mic, and please identify yourself. And we'll take a couple at a <laughs> yeah. time. All right, Dave Fulgham with Aviation Week. The, the broad question here is what do you need in the way of ISR? Um, General Carlisle, who plans and ops for the Air Force, said that they fully intend, even with the current budget crisis, to go on beyond 65 uh, UAV uh, orbits. And uh, so what share of that uh, are you asking for? And <clears throat> if you're not in that planning part, what, what are you asking for? Because it seems like ISR would help you as much as anything you could possibly get. Let's take another. Steve Morrison in the back. Steve is the former director of the Africa program. Uh, so. <laughs> good morning, uh, General. Thank you so much for, for your remarks and congratulations on all the great work. I wanted to focus on the budget and, uh, and the case that can be made to the American people right now. The, as we all know, I mean, we're in historically difficult budgetary circumstances right now, and DOD in particular, with the August package, with the super committee, with the projections looking forward. Uh, over the next several years, perhaps into the next full decade, we're going to see some significant contractions. And I would expect that AFRICOM, as a relatively new entity with relatively small budgets, might actually be quite vulnerable. And I wanted to ask you, how do you make the, you talked about setting priorities and having a regional approach. You're not all that well known to an American public or to a congressional audience, per se. How do you, what, where's your thinking right now in terms of making, under the current circumstances, making the very best, strongest, clearest case to a, uh, an environment here that is skeptical about putting dollars overseas, scared about our own economy, and very divided politically? Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And then in the way back there. Sasha Lezhna from the Enough Project. Uh, thank you for your comments, General. I was uh, pleased to hear you talk about the Lord's Resistance Army towards the beginning of your uh, speech in terms of priority areas. Um, I think it's a very positive development that the Pentagon is, is um, uh, deploying some military advisors to the LRA uh, conflict uh, in support of the existing efforts. And so uh, my question uh, about that deployment was, uh, how long do you see that as, as going forward? Uh, we've been pretty disappointed with the results from the Ugandan army uh, to date. Um, and is there any effort to increase the uh, number and the quality of troops uh, from Uganda that's uh, being deployed out there? They, they do have more elite forces, for example, the Presidential Guard Brigade. Uh, is, there, is there an effort to try to increase the quality of those forces? Thank you. Let's start with that. We'll come okay. back for another round. Those okay. Broad. Uh, if it's okay, I'll just, I'll just take them in, in sequence. Yep. Uh, so, Dave, on the ISR question, the, the, the first answer is no commander would ever say he or she has enough ISR. Uh, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's an insatiable appetite, I, I think. Um, uh, but, I, but I have to tell you that uh, given the, the missions that Africa Command has been handed, um, we've had the ISR necessary to accomplish those missions. It's principally been focused, uh, unsurprisingly, in East Africa, uh, more, more recently and currently, a heavy emphasis in, in Libya, and then uh, more broadly in uh, the Sahel, uh, focused on Al-Qaeda in the lands of the Islamic Maghreb. Um, the the near-term challenge, I think, will be as, uh, as NATO contemplates uh, concluding Operation Unified Protector, the, the NATO mission in, in Libya, to which the United States has contributed a pretty significant level of, uh, of collection assets. How much of that uh, do I need to keep uh, as Unified Protector ends and, and Libya uh, comes, the mi Libya mission set comes back to Africa Command um, in, a, in a normalized uh, relationship? Uh, we're going through that drill right now, but I, but I think for the near term, 
because of the threat of proliferation of weapons uh, principally, because of the, uh, the, the National Transitional Council, uh, hopefully at some point interim government's uh, interest in securing their own borders, uh, will have a sustained U.S. ISR present at, at least for the next several months. My guess is it'll probably be a little bit less than what's there right now. It'll be a little more focused perhaps on the, on the borders, uh, less focused on, on targeting, which, which uh, the assets are doing now in support of the NATO mission, and more broadly supportive of uh, border security, and again, tracking these, uh, the, 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 the trafficking routes for uh, for weapons. So I think that part uh, will, will continue. Um, as, as always, it's something we've got to watch very carefully. There, there will always be uh, pressure to, to reduce. And so, you know, one of my responsibilities is to continue to convey uh, through to General Dempsey and to Sec Secretary Panetta of what our operational requirements are. Uh, so far, Africa has uh, Africa's re Africom's requirements have been uh, uh, very well supported, and I think we'll I think we'll be okay in in that regard. The other challenge we face, of course, is for emerging requirements, and uh, and, and the challenge there is in is access and and basing. Um, you know where we are are almost wholly reliant upon uh, host nations to provide that uh, basing and, and access. So if there were to be an emerging emerging uh, uh, crisis elsewhere in the continent, then we, we obviously would have uh, to wrestle uh, through the issues of, of basing and overflight. Um, on the budget, you. you I, I just have one, yeah. one follow up. Have you any sense of where the SA 24s went from living there? Um, the, well, the first the question is first of all, you know, how, how many? We're, there is a state led, Department of State led. Um, Man Pads Task Force uh, that has been operating now for a couple of months, actually, with regional partners, uh, the neighboring countries, if you will, to to uh, to, to make sure we, that border security issues are uh, addressing this concern. There have been discussions very recently with senior members of the National Transitional Council. Uh, it's very clear to me uh, in a meeting that I attended with the uh, with. Uh, uh, Chairman Jalil and, and others, the National Transitional Council recognizes that concern and, and understands their responsibilities uh, to control the weapons, first of all, uh, try to regain control of those which, uh, which have fallen outside of the government's control. Uh, and so I think everything is on the table, whether it's a buyback program or others, I think, are, are all being considered. Um, there are, there are some worrying indicators that some man pads, type nonspecific, uh, have, have left the country. Uh, and, and, I, and I would just tell you that in, in my recent travels to most of the neighboring countries, this is, a, this is near the top of their security agenda. And they're focusing significant uh, collection, uh, law enforcement, and military efforts uh, to counter this threat, they, they they understand they all understand the seriousness uh, of of this uh, proliferation of weapons. So I, I don't know the specifics, but but certainly it's a worrying trend. Um, on on the budget, we 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 are in in the greater scheme of things pretty small potatoes in the in the in the budget area, uh, and and my guess is you know at some point somebody will 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 propose the notion that says well just you know just do away with with Africa Command, and I suppose if, if somebody made that proposal and they looked at it, they'd probably find it wouldn't make much difference in the, in the, in the budget world. Um, I, 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 the approach I take is I, I, I think that uh, we get disproportionate effect for a very modest in, investment. Um, it, it is sometimes uh, a tough sell to say, again, why should we be spending money in Africa, where we ought to be spending money at, at home. Um, it is the, the, the long-standing debate of, of prevention versus response. Um, and so I, I think Libya might be instructive in this regard. And of course, you can, you can never 
you know, exactly equate things. But, you know, we're in a billion, in the neighborhood of a billion of mil spending on military operations in Libya. Um, maybe, just maybe, we, we, you could avoid a future exercise like that through the expenditure and the investment of some millions of dollars over time uh, to help build the capacity of, uh, of, of African states' um, security forces to behave in responsible ways. Uh, they're professional, they're capable, they're responsive to legitimate civilian control, they're, they're supportive of the, the people of the country. It's an imprecise argument because you, can never, you can't prove the negative. But, uh, but, but, but I believe that uh, uh, that, that effort, that, that relatively small effort paid in prevention and deterrence, uh, building partner capacity, uh, I, I think uh, will pay off for us in the long run. It won't prevent every uh, emerging crisis. Uh, but what we strive to do is to, again, by increasing the defense capabilities of, the Afri of our African partners, and of the regional organizations, uh, build with them, within, help them build the capacity not only to prevent um, hostilities, but to, if sh should prevention fail, to be able to more effectively respond uh, to these emerging crises without uh, us having to become involved. And I think that's, uh, that's the direction that, that we clearly want to head in. Finally, I would say on the budget, it, it, at least at present, there is, an, it, it, certainly in my mind, and I think in many others, there is a, a very real threat to America from these violent organizations that exist in Africa. Uh, we've got to address that. Uh, again, mission failure is that threat comes home here, and we've got to do all that we can to prevent that from occurring. Uh, having said that, we're, we under, I understand very clearly we're going to be in, in, some, uh, in, in some tough budget discussions, but I think we have a pretty good case to make. Um, lastly, to the Lord's Resistance Army. I, I, I have to tell you, six months ago, uh, I, I didn't know anything about the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, you start to learn a little bit about this, and, uh, and if you ever had any question if there is evil in this world, uh, is, is resident in the person of Joseph Coney and in that organization. Uh, we now have legislation that requires uh, uh, us to, to help address the problem of the Lord's Resistance Army. And of course, you know, rule number one for the military is we follow the law. So there's a law that tells us to do this. Um, there, in, the, in the four nation boundary of Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and now the Republic of South Sudan, uh, the small group of the Lord's Resistance Army uh, continues to, to terrorize, they continue to murder, they continue to, to kidnap uh, people. Uh, the Ugandan People's Defense Force has been kind of the leading effort in this regard. They have had some successes, they uh, have had some uh, recent successes in uh, and killing and capturing uh, uh, some members of the Lord's Resistance Army, but none of the senior leaders. My best estimate at present is that Kony and the senior leaders are probably uh, in the Central African Republic. Uh, the, U the Uganda People's Defense Forces is shifting their effort uh, in, that, in that area. Uh, our role so far has been in, in facilitating intelligence uh, we're hopeful here in the very near future to be able to increase the number of, of uh, U.S. military advisors and, and trainers in that regard. Uh, there is a joint uh, combined uh, intel ops center that is manned almost exclusively by Africans. We have some small representation there to coordinate the efforts of all the different organizations. Uh, the U.S. in a State Department-led effort uh, uh, trained very effectively, trained a battalion of the, of the uh, armed forces of the Democratic Republic of Congo that's operating in, in, uh, in Northeast uh, DRC now in, in this effort. Uh, and we're in discussions with the DRC about, uh, about increasing that effort, perhaps training another battalion uh, to help, uh, help uh, uh, address this. Um, the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, the outcome is clear. We, you know, 
uh, that, the, that the Africans that are participating in these missions kill or capture Kony and his uh, senior leaders uh, and protect the citizenry, particularly in that four-state area. Uh, and, and, and I'm convinced that, that those four nations are committed to that mission. Okay, thank you. Let's go with Tony. <coughs> Welcome, sir. Tony Carroll with Manchester Trade, and I teach at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Um, uh, at this very stage, about two years ago or three years ago, uh, a former Assistant Secretary of State described AFRICOM as Peace Corps and steroids. Uh, we talked a little bit about the security mission of the Africa Command, but I'd like for you to address maybe some of the softer part of your command. Uh, the unusual ability of your establishment, institutions within your establishment, to respond to humanitarian crises, whether they be in the construction of, of dams and water supply, whether they be the construction of uh, emergency food storage, whether they help in the areas of health supply chain management. These are special skills that uh, you have and are needed in Africa. And as a Peace Corps volunteer, I don't feel threatened by a former Peace Corps volunteer. I don't feel threatened. I think that you have unusual capabilities that in the right space could do great good, as well as your security mission. Thank you, Tony. Let's go to Ed, and then the lady. Ed first, in the center. General, th working. Um, thank you very much. I'm Ed Barber from GoodWorks International, Andrew Young's consulting firm. Been working on Africa for 20 years, and I just, uh, this is pure coincidence, but my question follows right on Tony's. Uh, I was wondering about the <coughs> economic or quasi-economic uh, dimensions of your activities in Africa. Uh, dating way back in the 80s, uh, I was an admirer of the West Africa training crews and the civic action projects you all sometimes undertook in connection with that cruise, building a farm-to-market bridge in a remote part of Mauritania, or donating a couple of patrol boats to Senegal to enable them to enforce their off offshore fishing uh, jurisdiction. <coughs> And I wondered to what extent those kinds of functions uh, might continue or will they be squeezed out by budget uh, pressures? Uh, this is, these are sometimes uh, extraordinarily useful projects, small bucks, but uh, making a big difference. And again, as Tony said, uh, some of them are areas where you have unique capabilities. Thank you. And there's a lady right behind. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name is Rachel Smith, uh, Headquarters Department of the Army, G357. Um, going back to the budget question, with uh, the reduced budget, what are your thoughts regarding China's increased spending on the continent? And um, your perspective, are we going to fall too far behind as a strategic partner with our African partners? Thank you. Okay. Can I just add on to, to Tony's uh, kind of uh, Perhaps maybe you can be specific to in, in whether Africa is engaged in the Somalia um, uh, uh, humanitarian aspect of that as well. Um, thanks for that set, and then we'll come back for one more. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, the 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 not I guess lack of a better term the non traditional military activities of the command are are just as important as the uh, the the military side. Uh, in, in fact, you could probably make a pretty good argument because those contribute significantly to the underlying causes of, of instability across the continent. Uh, perhaps those in the long term uh, are, are more important. Uh, and, and, I, and I should mention, perhaps it's, a, it's a unusual for a guy in, in uniform, but uh, I'm a pretty big fan of the Peace Corps. One of the, uh, because it, it, uh, it maybe seemed a little bit of a non sequitur, but the, for many Africans, the only American that they will ever see in their lives is a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, and and that, that one individual or that small team's influence uh, lasts for generations uh, and, 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 and has a dramatic effect. So, so thanks for, for volunteering. We, we need more. And as you know, there are some places in Africa where the security situation is such that, that Peace Corps operations have had to been have to have had been have been suspended. Uh, so I think you know one of our roles is to try to help.
those countries get back to a situation where Peace Corps can come back in. Um, we do, we do uh, focus in a, in a lot of other areas, as, as uh, Tony mentioned. Uh, to assist in that regard uh, structurally, as many of you know, we have a, a deputy commander for civil military activities. Uh, currently, uh, Ambassador Tony Holmes, former ambassador to Burkina Faso, many of, of you know. Uh, uh, the first was uh, uh, Ambassador Mary Carlin Yates, who, who uh, just formally retired last Friday and in typical Yates family tradition, is now back on active duty as the Chargé in Khartoum. Uh, I, I guess that weekend was enough retirement for her. I'm not, I, I, I'm not a, uh, yeah, 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 John's a, John, uh, John, Ambassador John Yates is a little puzzled by that, but, but, uh, but they'll figure that out, I, I think. But, but and, and the others, the other, we have lots of other uh, non-DOD persons on the staff, but the other key one I would mention is our senior development advisor, uh, Mr. Mark White, who comes to us from, from AID. Those two senior leaders, uh, more than any other, are the, are the ones who, who help us in the command better understand how we can integrate traditional military activities in ways that facilitate uh, those, those programs. So we do that in small ways. So for example, uh, the Gambia, small country, uh, they have big flooding problems, uh, and that and those flooding problems, uh, you know, have have very significant adverse effect on on agriculture, on fisheries, and and what and what have you. So we say, okay, well, how do you how do you do that? Well, let's bring in the Army Corps of Engineers to help do an assessment of how do you you know if anybody knows flood control, it's kind of the Army Corps of Engineers. They know how to do this. That's a core competency. So so that's a way that we can again combine what is largely economic activity uh, with some, some military support. As many of you know, there are some, uh, some the, 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 there are armed force, U.S. armed forces, medical research centers and laboratories in, uh, in Africa, uh, which, uh, which do great work. Um, and, and I've come to, to really appreciate what they do. What I've asked them to do, uh, now that I've learned a little bit about them, is to find ways to expand their their work and increase uh, their collaboration with uh, with African national and regional uh, health programs, so that we can take this great expertise that is resident in the U.S. military chains and expand that more regionally into African civil society. Um, there are so there are ways to do that. One, one more example. Again, selfishly motivated, uh, this, this battalion that I mentioned, uh, training in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, a very innovative uh, uh, program to help them become self-sustaining with food. And so the Borlaug Institute has, has, uh, has developed uh, programs for that battalion that ha they have now have their own fish ponds, uh, they, they have their, their uh, uh, they, they grow their own, grow and process their own cassava. They have, uh, uh, I don't think they have chickens yet. They have pigs and they have, they have cattle for, for milk and cheese. Uh, and it's self-sustaining. Well, that's, that's a pretty good thing for a military, you know, to have as they, as they travel around. Other nations, South Sudan, for example, is looking to expand that. But they're also now, as several of these militaries are looking at programs of of demobilizing and, and reintegrating former soldiers into civil society, this is a program by which they can gain a skill. They gain some agricultural skill and then can, can transit out of the armed forces and, and be a meaningful contributor uh, into society. So those are a couple of the examples, and, 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 I, and Tony's right to kind of call me on this as I, as I spoke primarily of the, the traditional military aspect up front. The, the, the other activities, which we tend to be, do less visibly, which is okay by me, uh, in support of either other U.S. organizations, uh, African uh, organizations, or international organizations, our small contributions, I think, can, can be meaningful. Uh, continuing in the economic dimension, uh, I, 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 would, I would follow up, uh, add your questions about with a, with a specific focus on maritime security, which is so important to, to so many nations. Uh, you know, some would argue that the, that the, 
the genesis of, of East Africa piracy has its root in, in, uh, in the loss of, uh, of uh, fishing capabilities and, and, and income from fisheries off the coast of Somalia. So it has a, certainly has a security angle as well. But the economic uh, challenges in the maritime domain are very significant. It is important to recognize that almost everything that comes into or comes out of Africa does so by sea. And, and it's been very interesting. Most Africans don't think of themselves as a, as a maritime continent or as individual maritime states, but they truly are and highly dependent upon that. So we look for ways in which we can indeed uh, partner with, with coast guards or, or navies. Uh, Liberia, for example, which had no coast guard, a small effort to help them uh, do that. They've now conducted uh, 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 patrols in their, in their territorial waters uh, and, and have done fisheries enforcement in, in, uh, in concert with, uh, uh, with other government officials in, in Liberia. Uh, same in many other states uh, as, as well is an important thing. You ask a great question about will, will these kinds of efforts be sustainable in a declining budget area? Uh, there are questions being asked about, uh, about uh, our efforts in countering narcotics and, and other illicit trafficking. You know, are those core competencies? Are those things that, that perhaps are at risk? Uh, we, we've, got to, we've got to examine each, each and every one of those. Ideally, what we want to do is, is uh, get us out of that business and get the Africans to the point where they can execute these missions with, with either greatly reduced uh, or no U.S. support. But they're not at that point yet. Uh, and so I think uh, I would make the case that those efforts have to be sustained uh, for at least some, uh, some period of time. Um, Rachel, you asked the great question. I have to admit, I, it caused it's a little unfair for an army person to be asking yeah. another <laughs> army person. But, uh, um, but, but you know, there's great qu it. this great question of, of China uh, in Africa. And, and first of all, they are everywhere in, in Africa. Um, they're not, it's not a military rivalry, though there are lots of nations which, uh, which, which have Chinese military equipment um, but I, but I don't. It's not an adversarial uh, relationship with uh, with China. I, I would. I have found in these first couple of months that some African countries are are finding that the uh, the, the, the Chinese offer often offer uh, military equipment, perhaps at lower price than than we do. But the Africans are. Some Africans are finding that that without the sustaining programs that come behind that, um, that's not such a great deal. So they're looking to us now and say, okay, we now know why you're more expensive than the Chinese because in three years this, you know, this airplane, this tank, this uh, boat that we, that we got from the Chinese is no longer operable, whereas the stuff they get from us because we insist upon a sustaining package when they, when they get U.S. military equipment uh, that kind of that that works uh, works out pretty well. Um, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not particularly concerned about us falling strategically behind China in Africa. Uh, I, I think our interest there are certainly some areas where our interests are shared, and we should uh, further explore those. A, an example would be as I as I talked with some of you a few weeks ago, uh, Chinese recently uh, uh, provided. Uh, riverine craft <clears throat> to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Pretty essential piece of equipment, which we don't have much of, uh, is useful to the FARDC to, to have those assets. Uh, that, that now, along with the training that we provide, I think gives the FARDC a, a useful product. And I think there are perhaps some other areas, perhaps even in the area of professional military education, where we might uh, be able to partner with Chinese and others uh, to get bigger bang for the buck uh, in some African countries. Great. I believe we are unfortunately out of time. Um, that means I spoke too long. I'm sorry. No, no. This is great. Uh, for uh, someone who didn't spend uh, a, a day of his career on Africa in 36 years, you are certainly a quick study. Um, you know, what a, a, what a pleasure to have you here, um, hear your views really so articulately said, and making the case, I think, um, for the command and, and the future of the command here in Washington. Uh, please join me in thanking General Ham. Thank you all for joining us.
Um, we hope we get you back in the near future. Thanks so much. That was great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. I shall.